Um, I have sensed a call to return to um, expository preaching. And that simply means is really delving into the scriptures, uh, not so much topically, but grabbing some scripture or text and going through it to mine out the treasures that are in it. And I think we're in a generation and time where we need a little bit more of that uh, so that we can establish a firm foundation on God's word. Amen. So I'm excited about this, and I hope you will be too. Um, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. That's all you need to turn to. So if you have your Bible, your Bible app, go ahead and open it up. We will be in chapter 1 uh, for this time. And I will be coming back to continue uh, through the book of Colossians, which I'm very happy to be doing. I'm also teaching this uh, through Nganawagi, helping out there as uh, they do not have a pastor at this time. So I'm one of their um, regular speakers. So I'm just really blessed and privileged to be sharing God's word. Uh, I don't take it lightly. So let's dive into the book of Colossians. Uh, we won't be going through the whole book today. That's why I'll be coming back. <laughs> yes, hallelujah. So just before we dive in, I want to give you a, a little bit of uh, facts or things to think about. The key theme of Colossians, and this is probably why right now it's so much on my heart, is that it's the preeminence, the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. Do we need to hear that today? Yes, we do. Absolutely. And the key verses in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. And in the New Living Translation, it says, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every, every ruler and authority. Now, chapters 1 and 2 are the doctrinal portion, yes, I'll be in chapter 1, of the doctrinal portion of the book about the preeminence of Jesus Christ as creator, savior, Lord. And then chapters 3 and 4, the practical portion of the book in how to work out the preeminence of Christ in our everyday lives. Colossians is very similar to Ephesians with this difference. Ephesians emphasizes the um, body of Christ, the church, whereas Colossians emphasizes the head of the church, Jesus Christ. That's why I want to start in Colossians, because it's all about Jesus. And we're living in a time and day where we need to really lift up Christ and who he is. So we begin, salutation. <laughs> Chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation today. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God our Father give you grace and peace. And one of the things that I really feel this call to preach through the Bible in this manner is my desire, my prayer, is that the body of Christ would catch a new um, desire, a new passion for the word of God. Now, Paul has likely never been to Colossae, uh, but he feels this pastoral responsibility for this church, and I'll get into a little bit of why later. And at the time of this writing, which might have been about 60 AD, how many of you feel like you're in Bible school today? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> now, the apostle Paul was in a Roman prison at this time, making this letter one of four uh, of the four prison epistles. All right, which are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. These are the four letters that Paul wrote while he was in a Roman prison. <laughs> and Timothy traveled with Paul on his missionary journeys, and Paul considered him as a son. They worked together for more than a decade, and Timothy also landed in prison at one point for his faith. Now, the typical writing of the day was to identify the author in the opening remarks, followed by a greeting of peace. 
And so Paul, right off from the start, he reminds his readers that he was called by God as an apostle to lend authority to his words, especially since he had never been there in person. And he dresses them as brothers and sisters because they are fellow believers and part of the family. They are in Christ. And Paul was a Jew, the, the, and the Colossians were Gentiles. And God sent Paul as an apostle. What is an apostle? A sent one. Let's just break it down to its simplicity. An apostle is a sent one to the Gentiles with the good news. Now, the power of the gospel is demonstrated in its ability to break down the barriers of separation that enable Gentiles to be brought into the family of God. How many Gentiles do we have here today? <laughs> and we have been brought into the family of God by the power of the gospel. You see, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor female, slave nor free, but we are one in Christ. And this is the drastic and radical outcome of the good news, which we do not quite comprehend because we don't understand what happened in those days and how very, very hostile Jews and Gentiles were towards one another. Let's continue. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. We always pray for you, and we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. And so Paul prays with thanksgiving. Why does Paul pair prayer and thanksgiving right why does he do that because he knows the power of the one to whom he is praying see it's not the power of prayer but it's the power of the one to whom you pray amen and so he is um, praying knowing that he is praying from a place of victory not from a place of defeat and we, too, need to pray from the place of victory and not from a place of defeat. And so he hears this good report, and this prompts him to pray for them all the more. Now, how often are our prayers focused on people who are really going through a tough time? They're doing, you know, they're going through stuff. But Paul prays for them. They're doing well, and he prays for them even more. And so we pray for people even when they're doing well because we know that they will be a target. <laughs> All right, and so what does Paul, he, he mentions these things. Paul thanks God for the Colossians specifically for their faith in Christ, their love for the saints, and their hope of heaven, right? And we've seen those before, right? Faith, love, and hope. 1 Corinthians 13, 13. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. love. And the greatest of these is? Love. love. Excellent class. Excellent. <laughs> I love it. See, faith, hope, and love are what characterizes a believer in Christ. All right, now we're going to start getting to the nitty-gritty. <laughs> Salutation is over. <laughs> All right. And we continue to see these things as we grow in Christ. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. By their love for one another, they will know, right? The world will know that they are God, Christ's disciples. Hope in eternity is what spurred them on. Think about this. Their faith and love was fueled by the hope that was before them. The glorious future that Christ has established in the heavenly realm beyond this physical existence here is the foundation of their faith and love which are expressed in action. Faith always expresses itself in action. All right. So hope is powerful. In Ephesians, Paul prayed that the saints would know the hope of their calling, 
that they would grasp a sense of what was awaiting them. And Peter, in 1 Peter 1, 3 to 5, says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled beyond the reach of change and decay. And so the, that very hope motivated the Colossians to act in faith and love. And so my question today for us is, does the expectation I have of my eternal home compel me to act in faith and love? Amen. We go on in verse 6, Colossians 1, 6. The same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. You see, wherever the gospel went, it bore fruit. It bears fruit. The gospel is not cultural. It is not ethnic, it is not for a select group of people, but for whosoever will. Whosoever will. The power of the gospel is able to transform lives. No matter what the background, no matter what culture, ethnicity, or geographical location of a people. The power of the gospel is universal. Universal. And evidence of the gospel is fruitfulness in the lives of believers. The power of the gospel is transformation. A new heart is given. How many new hearts do we have here today? Hallelujah. Amen. Right? There's a change in purpose, in direction, in behavior. <laughs> right? <laughs> Every area of our lives should be affected by the gospel. Now we go on in verse 7. Are you enjoying this so far? Yes. Good. <laughs> verse 7, you learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. Now, Epaphras is believed to be the founder of the church at Colossae. It's believed that he heard the gospel preached through Paul while he was in Ephesus. And then he returned to Colossae where he planted the church, and it's believed he also planted in Laodicea and Hierapolis. All right, now Epaphras visits Paul in Rome and shares with Paul how the church is doing. And generally speaking they're, speaking, they're doing great, right? They've got their faith, they've got hope, they've got love going on, and they're growing, they're standing in faith, and they're known for that love. But he also tells them of a Colossian heresy that's beginning to creep into the church and affect them and threaten the church. And this is what prompts Paul to write this letter to the Colossians. He wants them to help he wants to help them deal with a dangerous teaching that is threatening their faith. Now there's no real specific term for this Colossian heresy. That's why we call it the Colossian heresy right? Wow. <laughs> but it's this mixed bag of mystical, legalistic, and Gnostic beliefs, such as spirit is good, matter is evil, the physical is evil, and one must follow ceremonies, rituals, restrictions in order to be saved or perfected, right? Legalism, performance-based Christianity, one must, must deny the body and live in strict asceticism, which means severe self-discipline, avoidance of all forms of indulgence. Now, there's a few I could avoid. <laughs> Chocolate, you know. <laughs> but typically, they would do this for religious reasons, right? The practice of the denial of physical or um, psychological desires in order to attain a spiritual ideal or goal. 
Harsh treatment of the body is a means to control its lusts, which does not work. All right. In this type of heresy, angels must be worshipped. Uh-oh. So we get into names, ranks, all sorts of stuff. A whole theology of angels <laughs> and worshipping them. Christ was not both human and divine. Here's one. One must obtain secret knowledge in order to be saved or perfected. And this was not available to everyone, right? It's elitism, special knowledge that God gives certain leaders, reveals to certain people, like codes and formulas and certain types of prayers, right, that are shared only with the initiated. That does not sound like a universal gospel to me. One must adhere to human wisdom, tradition, and philosophies. It's even better to combine aspects of several religions. And then there's nothing wrong with immorality. So there's all these contradictions within it. But these are the things that were creeping into the church. Sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Not much has changed. <laughs> no, not here. No. <laughs> See, we face the same issues, philosophies, humanism, legalism, mysticism. And Paul will go on to touch on these in, in later in chapter 2. And so Paul addresses the Colossi heresy brilliantly through this book. He focuses on truth, and he first prays for the Colossian believers. Colossians 1, verses 9 to 12. Remember, he's heard of their great faith, etc. So he says, so we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord, and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience, endurance and patience you need. <laughs> May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. Hallelujah. So he gets into this, the knowledge of God's will, right? Right? With spiritual wisdom and understanding, these were buzzwords among the, the heresies of the day, right? Trigger words, buzzwords, wisdom, understanding, spiritual knowledge. <laughs> and part of the Colossae heresy was this desire to accumulate knowledge as well as adhere to wis human wisdom. But what is God's will? What is God's will? When we read the scriptures, we need to get an understanding of what they're talking about because too often we read it through our own interpretation and understanding, well, God's will is I do this or I do that. No, the Bible tells us what God's will. God purposed, he planned to save men through Jesus Christ alone. Okay? Not by angels, not by works, not by special ceremonies. His will is to reconcile all things to himself. The mystery of God's will is that he might gather together in one all things in Christ. And we read in Ephesians 3, 6, and 7, just in case you don't believe me, <laughs> and this is God's plan. This is God's will. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. And so Paul begins to unravel the false teachings with the mind-blowing truth that they had been grafted into the family of God and enjoyed all the same privileges and promises that the Jews had been given, not by some secret knowledge or special ceremony, but by Christ alone. And this was mind-blowing because of the time they were living in. There was hostility. There were division 
I won't go into all of that, but knowing God's will and having spiritual understanding of how to apply that knowledge would enable them to live in such a way that would honor and please God. And it would manifest in this way, fruitfulness. He prays that the knowledge and wisdom that comes from God would impact their way of living, their way of living. It would lead to changed lives and give direction. They would know how they ought to walk. We should know how we ought to walk, amen, as believers in Christ. See, accumulating knowledge for the sake of knowledge is meaningless if you don't do something with the knowledge. But if you believe that matter is evil, there's no outworking of the knowledge. Okay? But it has to have a practical outflow in this life that honors God. And wisdom shows us that practical outflow. How to apply it, which will produce fruit that would glorify God. Jesus said in John 15, right? He is the vine and we are the branches. And as we abide in him, live in Christ, we are to bear fruit, much fruit, and it brings great glory to God. So we are saved by faith, but why? We are his workmanship to do good works, right? In Ephesians, be fruitful in every good work, small or big. Whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might as unto the Lord. So is the knowledge of God's will in my life manifesting fruitfulness? Has it affected the way I live? <laughs> Am I doing the good works that God prepared for me? So fruitfulness, growth as well, growth. Growth, maturity, fruitfulness come from knowing God. Understanding that God's purpose for the universe are being accomplished through Christ and his death and resurrection is crucial to understanding how we should live. Are you beginning to see the richness of God's word? One preacher said, you know, no preacher could ever speak more profoundly than what God has already spoken. Knowing God is not sequestering ourselves away in some hidden place, <laughs> just me and God, mystical experiences and everything spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. That's how cults start. That's how the heresies come, right? But maturing wisdom leads to transformed relationships with God and with others and others. Relationships are affected by knowing God because now the Spirit of God <laughs> works in kindness and mercy, compassion, forgiveness as we do life together, as we do family together. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so how do we get to know God? The greatest source of knowledge for us is in the Word of God because it points us to the living Word, and that is key because if we begin to hold up this higher than the Lord, like all we, we don't want Bible idolatry. We want the Word to point us to the living Word, Jesus Christ. All right, And the only way we can know God is because he has chosen to reveal himself <laughs> to us through Christ, through Jesus Christ. And Paul gets in, in greater depth in the later in the chapter. So what am I doing to grow in the knowledge of God? Am I focused on knowing him? On knowing him? That's the key. What, el what else happens when we begin to understand and know the knowledge of God, fruitfulness and what we just spoke about, and strengthened with glorious power. He goes on to pray they will endure, persevere, and continue to stand in the faith in spite of the trials of persecution or, draw, or the draw of false teachers and their teachings. Stand firm in the faith and the truth which you 
heard. All right, and the same power that raised Christ from the dead <laughs> is available to strengthen Christians for endurance and patience. I like what Matthew Henry says. He says, to be strengthened is to be furnished by the grace of God for every good work and fortified by that grace against every evil one. It is to be enabled to do our duty and still to hold fast our integrity. So am I allowing the power of God to work endurance and stability in my life? Of course, you know, when I'm asking these questions, I'm also asking you. <laughs> Just, you know, join in. <laughs> what else happens? Thanksgiving. Knowledge of God's will manifests in thanksgiving to the Father. Why? Because they've been brought into the family of God and right standing as his children. And a mark of Christianity is thanksgiving, which is a whole message I brought before here, right? Our dialect is thanksgiving, gratitude. So is thanksgiving my dialect? Am I listening to what I'm saying? So knowing God's will should manifest in fruitfulness, growth, endurance, and thanksgiving. And this prayer that Paul prays is something we can pray over ourselves often, as well as for others, especially when we don't know what to pray. Pray these things over them. Pray them over ourselves. All right, let's continue. Chapter 1, verses 12, the uh, second half of 12 to 14. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. So here we see the benefits of faith in Christ. We've received an inheritance what was once exclusively Israel's, they now shared as co-heirs with Jewish believers in Christ because they too are his children. And I repeat, this is a mind-blowing, startling revelation because of the hostility and division that existed between Jews and Gentiles. Remember he said the, uh, the, the, the barrier of hostility and separation has been brought down, destroyed. And so an inheritance is not something we can earn, right? Like we do wages. Paul reminds us that it is God's good pleasure, right? And will to reconcile all things to himself. And he has done the work and we are the beneficiaries. Our name has been written on the form. The beneficiary is Debbie, is Sandy, is Millie, is Sally, is Mike, right? It is God himself that enables or qualifies us to share in the inheritance. 1 John 3, 1, see how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children, and that is what we are. Yeah. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and now you Gentiles, that's us. <laughs> have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. And the Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. Romans 5.12, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. And because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. So do I fully grasp my adoption into the family of God? And if so, how should it impact my thinking and behavior? We have been delivered from darkness. They have been delivered from the bondage of dark powers, Paul says, rescued by a sovereign power. 
Spurgeon says, Beloved, we still are tempted by Satan, but we are not under his power. We have to fight with him, but we are not his slaves. He is not our king. He has no rights over us. We do not obey him. We will not listen to his temptations. Ephesians 1, 19 to 22 tells us, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe in him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realms. Now he is far above every ruler of authority, of power, or leader, or anything else. Not only in this world, but also in the world to come. And God has put all things under the authority of Christ and may, has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. We have been rescued by a sovereign power. Do I live knowing I am free from the enemy's power? It is a great question. We've been transferred to eternal kingdom of light. According to Barclay, the word we translate conveyed or transferred had a special significance in the ancient world. When one empire conquered another, the custom was to take the population of the defeated empire and transfer it completely to the conqueror's land. <laughs> All right, yeah, somebody get excited. <laughs> All right, they had been completely transferred to the kingdom of God. Therefore, Satan no longer had any rule over them. Everything they had, everything they were now belonged to God. They were under a new administration. We are under a new administration, and it's a better one. It's a better one. Do I live in the light? no longer under the domain of darkness. There is no fellowship between light and darkness. So if we are children of the light, we need to live as children of the light. And our freedom was purchased. The price for freedom had been paid in full through the blood of Jesus Christ. They were free from sin and judgment. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 20, for you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. And God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. So how do I value the blood of Christ in my life? Communion is a good way. And lastly, sins were forgiven. And the original language gives the idea of sin and guilt being sent away. Never more to be a barrier or a separation between the believer and God. And so a very simple question, because we know that's a whole message, right? Do I hold on to past sin as if they still have power over me? Do I hold on to past sin as if they still have power over me? So the marks of a believer, that was my cue to conclude. <laughs> Marks of a believer, faith, love, and hope. The knowledge of God's will manifests in fruitfulness, growth, patience, endurance, thanksgiving. The benefits we receive an inheritance, deliverance, freedom, and forgiveness. We have been transferred from darkness to light, from slaves to sons, from guilt to pardon, from death to to life. Amen? Amen? And Paul is going to go on in this next section when I can't wait to share this beautiful, profound message of who Christ is. 
So, Father, thank you for your word. It is rich. It is rich. And I thank you that it points to Christ alone and the great work he has done for us by his death and resurrection and his life. And thank you that we are now partakers of that life, that our wealth really is in the cross. Help us to know those riches that are found in you and to really walk as children of the light, to know our place in you. Father, I thank you for each one that is here, and I pray, Holy Spirit, you would bring your word alive in their hearts and that it would create a hunger and a thirsting for more of your word, to be firmly established in it, from which we grow and are strengthened. So, Lord, thank you for this time together. In your precious name, amen.